MM hospitals have a unique technological advancement to save lives in crisis areas. They have a 20 minutes rapid deployment and repack time, which is insanely fast. Their mobile and modular hospitals are transportable via air, sea and land as a standard 20 feet containers. Millennium Robotics' mission is to provide innovative robotic solutions for challenging environments. Their cutting-edge robotic solutions will fulfill a higher purpose, enabling more meaningful lives. Through their products and services, they seek to increase human safety and labor efficiency in many targeted industries, particularly defense, agriculture, forestry, municipal services, rescue and mining. Kraftworks builds drones with onboard machine vision and mobile connectivity. Their drones can detect humans and cars in the location of the fire and other disaster areas. Their solution automatically shares time-critical information instantly with a control room using mobile networks. Thank you very much for that introductory video, um, but perhaps it is uh, best to hear from the gentlemen themselves here on stage uh, in what I have to say are very, very comfortable chairs. I hope you're equally comfortable uh, over here or, of course, uh, back at home. Um, Margos, uh, working with MM Hospital as the CEO, of course, um, can you tell us more about what, what you do these days and what you focus on? Yes, um, we have developed during the last eight years, uh, together with Estonian Defence Forces and the uh, Ministry of uh, Defence, the new generation uh, field hospital for military use, but also for disaster management. And uh, it is the new generation, what means that uh, the innovation has been mainly based on the rapid deployment capabilities. So we can watch the video and I can explain as well at the same time uh, what is the innovation. So uh, the first thing is that uh, the average uh, field hospitals, even if they are packed into the containers, they need uh, the special logistic support like cranes and, and everything else. These containers can deploy themselves itself. Uh, all uh, Road 2 level uh, hospital, it means that it has uh, operational MO, uh, triage, uh, pharmacy, uh, everything what uh, you can imagine the local uh, hospital has in this quality as well can be deployed within 120 minutes. And actually, our crew has been uh, deployed it as well within one hour. And the case is that uh, all this equipment. You can imagine in average uh, high-level operational uh, hospital, uh, they are fit in already to this hospital. So the hospital can be in a starting position and start to work within uh, one and a half hours. This is a very, very quick uh, solution and we have never uh, met uh, such a solution during NATO military exercises. Uh, now we have, uh, how to say, the war is a great innovation opportunity as well. War is not very good, but let's be honest, innovation uh, is there. And our, our solutions now uh, are not only used by Estonian military, but also together with the German government, we have sent already two Road 2 level hospitals to Ukraine. So now we have 24-7 uh, support for these two uh, hospitals and also we can get the feedback uh, for uh, the further uh, developments from the real war situation. And what has been uh, proven is that uh, for Russia, uh, all uh, medical infrastructure is a priority target. So even our hospitals, they have been under uh, selling. But the main thing is that we are the only solution which has been survived because of the high mobility. It means that uh, these hospitals must move all the time they can uh, be repacked and redeployed, and they move together with, uh, with troops. And, and what is the main innovation for us as well is the tactical uh, maneuverable. So we get the, the real experience from the war situation. And also, in the different exercises, we can, we can so-called exercise the situation, but the war situation is different. If you get like 50 heavily wounded soldiers at once, into the hospital, so you have to practice uh, how to save them and who to save, let me be honest. And the second thing is that how to move together with troops, because Ukrainians, they have shown and proven that uh, this kind of uh, classical, technical 
uh, behavior is not common anymore because uh, they are moving fast with the troops and they need a medical backup uh, together with them. And the second thing is that uh, we have, I, I'm not going to say names of the different countries' uh, field hospitals, but uh, they have been destroyed during the, this couple of, uh, uh, or even close to a year, uh, mainly because they are not able to move. We have had uh, some um, uh, attacks close to the hospital, and then the hospital has been packed and moved to the new place. And so this is, this is the one, one thing which is very important. And uh, our first hospital, which moved in just after the war started again, in 24th of February, uh, since uh, March to September, it has rescued more than 2,000 soldiers' lives. So normally people are thinking that innovation is only about weapons and uh, guns and, and uh, fighters. But let's be honest that uh, medical support is most important for the soldiers and for their morale as well. And, uh, and we can say that uh, we have been saving more lives than any tank can destroy. So this is our uh, opportunity to support as well uh, Ukraine. And also we have enormous interests uh, from uh, different countries uh, who has understand that uh, uh, medical support is, is as, as much important as, uh, as uh, military capability. Thank you. Very well, Margus. Thank you so much for that uh, insight. Um, quite, quite valuable and, of course, very topical, as you pointed out. Uh, Raul, tell us more about Milram. Yes, uh, thank you very much. First of all, it's my pleasure to be here. And big thanks for the organizers uh, setting up the event today. And uh, as I understand, we are providing this kind of like side of activity to the lunch uh, we have at the moment. So all of you who are having a lunch at the moment and having drink, you can be part of the presentation. So if you're focusing a little bit uh, to that at the moment as well. So who we are, we are actually uh, I would say the leading uh, robotics company in Europe at the moment. And what we do, I have a short video clip about that. Um, very shortly, we are a robotic engineering company uh, who provides and develops innovative solutions uh, in the ground environment. So we are producing unmanned ground systems, vehicles or platforms. So they are like a drones that we all know about, but we use them on the ground. Uh, in order to describe it a little bit differently, maybe I would say that uh, we are like a Tesla, but off-road. So we don't uh, make vehicles to drive on the streets, but uh, we uh, produce vehicles to drive off-road in the challenging environments. And uh, there is another distinction also, what we have to Tesla is that when you throw a stone to the vehicle, the, it doesn't break down. So we, we think that uh, this is pretty, pretty amazing, actually. Uh, and as you see from the video, uh, we have different platforms. We have uh, produced them for the mining, for example, or forestry, or firefighting, but of course at the moment we are focusing on the military capabilities. So because of the war in Ukraine, we have put a lot of emphasis to the military capabilities. We have done it actually for several years, but now uh, we are putting the most effort to, to that environment. Uh, what is the main goal? The main goal is to take away the dangerous and the dirty jobs from humans who normally don't want to do these kind of uh, activities. Uh, and on this video at the moment you see, for example, the uh, firefighting vehicle, or that's just one version of that. We have many others, but uh, shortly, what is our story? You see on the slide, we started with the small one. So it's called in the in the newspapers also a uh, robotic uh, garage, for example. So you can put different uh, uh, stuff on this vehicle, but also you can put the weapon systems or whatever you want. 
But we have also developed a bigger one that we call uh, uh, TypeX, and this is a really a very serious uh, uh, fighting vehicle for the infantry forces or uh, motorized infantry forces. But we have a totally separate product line, what we call Multiscope, and this is for the civilian purposes. But that's so not maybe the most important aspect of the vehicles. The most important aspect is the brain that we put into the vehicle. So what makes the vehicles autonomous? And we have developed this brain, and we can also put the brain to the existing vehicles. So what, like we have done in Germany, for example, uh, we have taken the brain, the, the AI, and put to the old-fashioned uh, bridge tank in order to make it remotely controlled, but also or not autonomously used. So we can actually modernize the ex existing capabilities. And that's maybe what has been the biggest lessons learned over the years, because first we try to provide the totally autonomous vehicles, but we learned soon that uh, the clients are not ready yet. Even though everybody understands that robotics is important and we can use it very well, but uh, we have to just go through the learning curve. Everybody understands better if you could put autonomy to the existing vehicles and later to use totally independent ones. And on this slide you can see now uh, different product ranges, so you see that the platform is the same, but we can put uh, different payloads on that. And we have also provided these vehicles to several countries, including Ukraine from this year. And I don't know if you know or not, but the Russian government has offered a bounty for the vehicle. So if somebody catches the vehicle and gives it uh, to the Russia, then the bounty is one million rubles at the moment. So it's bigger than one soldier's uh, yearly salary. So that's all from my side for the introduction. Thank you. Very well, thank you. I was just about to say, a million rubles these days is like 30 euros, I think, if I've got my conversion rate right. But uh, very impressive, nonetheless. <laughs> um, Matthias, uh, tell us more about Kratworks. Thank you. Um, good to be part of this awesome event. Uh, Matthias Luha from Kratworks. So we are building uh, drones that use machine vision on board. And we started with this environmental promise that we can set back global greenhouse gas emissions by 1%. And the way we want to do it is that uh, when our drone flies, we use onboard machine vision module to look at the landscape. And we know where the fire is. And we can help firefighters to contain it before it reaches out of control. And fires are really. Um, they emit like 15 to 20 percent from global greenhouse gas emissions. So if we could set back just one tenth of those, that would actually mean a reduction of one percent from the global emissions. Um, but back to the drones. So um, machine vision on the drone enables us to look at fire and put it on a map or humans or cars. Um, and then we connect them to GSM networks, which means that whatever detections we do, they will be displayed to where it actually matters, to the control room, so that those guys who make the decisions can then get a live uh, map of the actual situation on the ground. Um, and we also have a drone nest solution. So this enables you to place the drone somewhere and use it uh, very frequently. For example, if you have a har harbor, you can use the drone to fly out from the drone nest and take measurements from the chimneys of the sea vessels and figure out if they are using dirty or clean ship fuel, for example. But anyway, maybe I will explain it with our video on the background. Um, so just a few months ago, we did a live demo when our uh, chief engineer uh, was in California and the drone was in Tallinn, Estonia. So here you see we are setting up small simulated fires, like small hotspots, so that we would have something to show on the, um, for the machine vision module. Hey, that's me. 
Um, so it's nine o'clock, uh, we are doing fires, and then our chief engineer is in California, where it's 12 o'clock at daytime across the Atlantic Ocean, and he actually operates the drone that is located in Estonia. Across the Atlantic Ocean, nine time zones, uh, real-time um, operation. And what we do is then, as you see here also in the video, uh, we use the machine vision to look at the landscape to separate where the fire is. So soon you will see um, on the left side of the screen there is an image of the thermal camera. And then in the bottom right corner you will see how it looks like on the map. So thermal camera image on the left and the map icons on the right. And this is then uh, what we provided for those firefighters in North America, they could get a real-time situational awareness map of this uh, simulated fire. And I guess uh, like it doesn't really matter if you use this technology on small multirotors or large fixed-wing planes. The idea is to provide live situational awareness map for firefighters and first responders. Um, and maybe also to soldiers and border guards, and hopefully to save lives and save the planet. Thank you. Very well. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, you almost touched on a question that I want to ask you later, but we'll get back to that. Uh, perhaps we start uh, with uh, Margus. Um, one of the things, of, of course, there are different use cases for, for your hospital solution, and uh, I'm sure you will, you will talk about that at, at more length. Um, but I was also additionally wondering, what is the kind of training time that a, a medical team would expect for the whole setup? To what extent does it uh, include the, the, the military forces as well? How does that work? It's a very good question that, uh, of course, we are not training uh, doctors because they have trained already, I don't know, couple of years probably at the university and practice, but uh, to use this uh, and to deploy and run the hospital, uh, it takes a couple of days, let's be honest. And we have this uh, experience with the Ukrainian uh, situation when we sent in uh, the first hospital. Uh, it had to, it was planned, uh, the training, we are working together with the Estonian Defense Forces and MOD. So they had to uh, train the Ukrainian crew, about like 20, 25 people from Ukraine, the specialists for a week in Estonia. But the war started and nobody could get out. So what I did was uh, I collected uh, the Ukrainian citizens, truck drivers and medical uh, people, uh, and we trained them within three days. And I sent them, I went together with them to Ukraine. And they trained uh, the Ukrainian military people within a couple of days. So to run this hospital, to, to study how does it work and how to deploy and redeploy, it's, uh, it's a question of a couple of days. But of course, uh, uh, the medical understanding, it must be there, of course. So it's, and the main thing is that we don't need logistical support, cranes and, and other things. Mainly the crew which is uh, working with this uh, can deploy the hospital and also redeploy. So this is uh, what is very important for military because the main problem is how to uh, how to guarantee the logistical support for the different uh, tactical uh, uh, units. We don't need logistical support, it's independent. So just to confirm, it's sort of uh, regular truck-sized containers that we're talking about? Or? Yeah, during the transportation uh, mode, uh, this is, uh, it, all this hospital fits into the 8, uh, 20 feet uh, average container. And you can transport uh, by, by, with planes or maritime or, or uh, you know, by trucks. And it needs only the average 20 feet container truck. Very interesting. It has a special legs which coming out and, uh, and uh, as you saw as well from video, lifting up, truck is moving away and putting down. And this is automatic as well, so it can fit together with other containers. Uh, very well. Uh, uh, Raul, you, you mentioned the multi-scope uh, platform for civilian purposes. Um, which one has been the most interesting to clients around the globe? Like, are there different customer groups depending on, on the geography that we're talking about? And also, perhaps, has there been uh, a, a client asking for some kind of uh, version of civilian purpose that you haven't thought about? One of the things that I saw uh, in the video was the clearing of the snow on, on pedestrian paths and so on. So, like, what are the kinds of expectations that customers have in that area? Uh, I have to admit that at the moment the most interesting uh, product range is still the military products because the 
other products, we have uh, uh, produced uh, prototypes, and because we are, uh, by DNA, we are engineering company. So we, we produce different prototypes, and then we interact with the client, and we produce for the client these vehicles, what the client wants. So uh, we don't do the mass production, but uh, we do most, uh, mostly the custom-made suits, tailored-made suits for the customer. And at the moment, it seems to be that uh, the biggest interest, interest is in the military products. And I would say that in Europe at the moment, it seems to be that the Netherlands is really leading the way because they have already done the experiments. The years ago, they uh, procured a couple of vehicles. Now they have more, and they are about to uh, procure hundreds. So they have thought through that how to use the robotics in the military environment. And that's, I would say, is the biggest uh, challenge at the moment, that even though we might think that it's so obvious that if the robot capability is there, so let's take it and let's use it. But it's not so simple in the organizational level, especially in the military forces. So they have to reconsider how do you do the supply, maintenance, all these sorts of things. Even though the robotic systems are cheaper, easier to maintain, you don't need to protect them so much because you don't put personnel inside. So there are obvious pros for this technology, but the big organizations have to think through that how to integrate this capability to the existing ones. That's why we actually set up a team this year to, to, produ or to pro provide this kind of like a consultancy service for the customer. We do that in Italy, for example. We, we help the Italian army in order to figure out that how to use robotics in the, in the service. So that seems to be the case at the moment. It's, it's funny. It doesn't matter whether we talk about the transportation sector, as we did just a couple of minutes ago, or whether we talk about, about the military uh, area. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, in the, in the era of military, it comes down to military doctrine you know, and, and strategy. And, uh, and that requires a, a change in mindset, effectively. Sort of exactly. How do you supply? You know, how would you use uh, these, these different uh, tools to, to make the soldiers' jobs uh, uh, easier or less dangerous, ideally both? Um, so very, very interesting insight. Um, Matthias, you, you already mentioned uh, some of the use cases, but perhaps uh, you can tell me more about the, the future plans uh, for, for your business and uh, where you see the, the primary use cases in the future as well. Well, I think in the immediate future, we will start to monitor when Milram uh, drives out their uh, rover and, you know, you, mi you might find it ends up in Russia because of bounty. <laughs> but... Um, Mm. We have the destroy button there, you know, just press and then it explodes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so we are now doing um, a bit of a focus shift, obviously, because uh, of Ukraine also. Um, we, are, we are sending our drones there for uh, border guard use case. Mm. And, um, and the, the way they will be used there is that... Um, Instead of GSM connectivity, we use a six-frequency uh, channel radio that's uh, quite resistant to jamming. Um, and also, there is uh, some use cases, you, like some detections you can do with the machine vision module that hopefully helps those operators. Um, as far as I understand, you've, uh, you've had several engagements across Europe already. I think yesterday at dinner, we talked about Moldova as an example. Um, but can, in general, can you, can you tell us what the, what the use cases are right now? So is it border guards primarily or something else as well? Border guards uh, in Moldova, there is a forest management company in Georgia. So those are together with the Estonian company called Tefsek Intel. They are doing a surveillance trailer and our drone is inside it. So with our drone nest solution. Mm, Tallinn municipality police. Hopefully they will be looking for people um, who have swum, swum too far. How, how would that be in English? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who, have, who are like too far from the beach or um, to prevent drownings and uh, those kind of use cases. Maybe looking for ice on the roofs because we do have those ice spikes problem in the winter, falling down from the, from the roofs. Um, so I think, I think what, what you mentioned there, sort of uh, uh, part of your sentence was also that uh, 
you're happy to integrate with other companies, so you're quite flexible in your approach. And uh, if there is if there is another bigger tool that where you can integrate that works perfectly well for you, I understand correctly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we think of our solution kind of like a drone as a platform, so that the hardware is there. But uh, if your use case is that you need to locate trash bins for some reason, then you can just throw your own machine vision algorithms on it and uh, look for trash bins if you want. With that in mind, let's locate the trash bins around the world. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please give a round of applause to the three gentlemen on stage. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much.